Hi, everyone. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube broadcast of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. This week, I am proud to be in conversation with activist, academic, journalist, and my friend, Roberto Lovato, whose memoir, Unforgetting, a memoir of family, migration, gangs, and revolution in the Americas was released on September 1. Welcome, Roberto. I'm so pleased to be in conversation with you today. Great to see you through this medium, Terry. So when I first approached you about doing this conversation, um, I asked, we talked about how uh, we wanna focus um, the conversation today. And there's so many um, angles and so many themes that you present in this book. And I just wanna show the audience, this is, this is the new book. Um, and you've done many, you've done quite a few interviews prior to, the, to today. And you said, I wanna talk about me as a US citizen, which of course you are. You were born in San Francisco to Salvadoran parents. And reading the book from that perspective as a US citizen was really, um, in a way it was liberating for me too, some of the themes that you cover. So one of the, the things that really hit me with this is um, when you talk about getting your um, papers and, and, and we'll back up for the audience as to how you got to Salvador and needed a new cedula, et cetera. But you wanted your papers in Salvador to say Roberto versus Robert, which was on your US passport. And for me, when I read that, all this stereotypes and history of immigration to the US just started kind of pouring into my mind as to how when you come here, you're basically in subtle ways and in, in overt ways told to just forget where you came from, forget the history of your country, your culture, your language, whatever violence you, you fled, whatever economic, educational uh, lack of opportunities you fled, you're here now. And we become this kind of mixed, I wouldn't even call it a culture, when, 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 especially reading your book and you, when, when you talk about the richness of the Salvadoran culture. So that to me was um, a, a real like strong theme about just forgetting in general. But in the case of your book, you are also talking about um, the violence that, that so many people forget on all levels, emotional violence, family violence, state violence, military violence, violence in, in leading to the, into forgetting um, in order to survive. And that seems a lot um, of what you in this book is a very personal journey and a very personal unraveling for you, but getting, tapping into the, some of the violence that occurred for your family, your father specifically. Yeah, uh, I, you hit it on nail on the head. I, I wrote the book. You never write, I don't think you, I, I don't write with one singular purpose. I write with different motives. One of my major motives for writing uh, Unforgetting was to simply get my story down on paper that I've witnessed over the last, especially 30 years mm -hmm. of my life with the relationship between El Salvador and the United States. It's obviously a personal story and, uh, you know, tells the story of a family of family secrets, but it's also about the secrets of nations, yeah. nations like El Salvador, na nations like the United States, and the way that these secrets can often have violent effects. I mean, if you look at, for example, in the beginning of the book, I have a quote by uh, a great theorist of of nations, Ernest Renan, and he basically says that forgetting is at the core and at the beginning of nations. It's a fundamental part of it. Or the way I like to say is if you look under the hood of any nation, you're gonna find the bones and bodies of indigenous people and others slaughtered to create these ideas. And so, you know, nations are very, uh, nations like progress are very genocidal concepts that have material effects. And so the material effects trickle downward through the family in what I call my SHI blank theory of 
state and family violence. And so my mission in the book is to link my experience of family to my experience of the states of El Salvador and the United States and the violence between them. And so uh, it's, a, it's an underworld journey, if anything. You know, I go into the underworld journey of my family history, my father's history, which is very intense uh, in terms of the kinds of violence that my family lived through in the 1930s in El Salvador during the age of La Matanza, when the Salvadoran government killed uh, something on the order of 10 to 30,000 people, we don't know, in a matter of weeks, in one of the most singularly violent episodes in world history, as far as the numbers of people killed per day, per month, per, per week, in a concentrated space, according to scholars at Oxford that I've interviewed. Um, the, story, the book also is, 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 is a way to look at the present violence of, say, the governments and the gangs in El Salvador that are perpetrating uh, extreme violence themselves, right? And, and I, I do mean government because oftentimes in the gang equation, we leave out the government part and the, the counterinsurgency policing that was brought on by characters like those in my book, like a guy named Attorney General William Barr of the Bush administration. Who's, who's, who's back? Who's, who's back, back with us? And yes. talking about gangs again. He talked about gangs and he, and he deployed massive FBI resources to begin the quote unquote gang war that we now know in the United States in the 1990s after the LA riots. He's now right. back and with And after Trump. Prop 187 here in California. Yeah, yeah, I, we, we were there. Of, yeah. um, so let, let's talk about, let's talk a little bit about the history of these gangs because this is something that um, is really lost now in the US media. And, and therefore in the US narrative that these, these gangs, particularly MS-13, were created in the United States. And you, all in, in Los Angeles by young people who had no families who had come here either on their own or had lost family here, Salvadoran specifically, Central Americans in general, and already there was a Mexican gang in existence. But this, you talk in your book about where the term Mara comes from and how it really was about friendship, friends gathering, families, friendship gathering, and how that whole term has been bastardized at this point and, 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 is, and refers to a real significant form of violence. But let's talk about the founding the creation of the, of the Maras in LA, just so our audience has a really clear understanding that it is not the story we currently hear. Yeah, um, as I document in the book, um, the, the word Maras, I didn't even know what it meant. I grew up with it uh, like in the 70s in El Salvador. I was, I was visiting El Salvador, my family there, and, you know, people would call themselves La Mara, which was basically friend, group of friends, hanging out on a corner, playing soccer, or playing chivolas, um, uh, or, 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 or different games, hide and seek, and it was La Mara. And so uh, I watched as that word suddenly was adopted by young men in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles Pico Union area, where I worked at an organization called CARES, and what was then called the Central American Refugee Center in the early 90s. And we were serving the Salvadoran and Guatemalan communities, providing legal services, etc. cetera. And uh, we were, our clients had these kids who had these tattoos with MS, Mara. And we started kind of encountering these gang members who were um, coming together primarily at that time, before that, like in the, in the 80s, they, were, they came together to listen to hard rock music like uh, Metallica, uh, Ronnie James Dio, and other kind of music that, that they liked and to protect, uh, but they eventually found themselves having to protect themselves from larger, better structured gangs like, what, like the Bloods, the Crips, and the Mexican Mafia. And so they had to start buying, you know, getting more formal and hardened to protect themselves in this environment. And 
to, to name themselves. They call themselves Mata. They took the word friend and applied it to them because they were friends who listened to, to rock music. Uh, eventually, though, that word has come to mean the heart of darkness, evil, quote unquote, to everybody from uh, the Obama administration who spent a lot of money researching and trying to help create this image of the uh, evil quote unquote gang member or now the Trump administration, the Pentagon, the US Southern Command, uh, a number of scholars that I've been tracking over the years who have kind of made an industry out of the creation of enemies, you know, that justify militarism in Latin America, drug war in Latin America and drug war and police militarism here. And now you have them fused in this thing I call and that others like Stuart Schrader call counterinsurgency policing. So, um, you know, as you don't know in the book, I, I track and I show the way that the Maras were used as a justification for this counterinsurgency policing that was uh, brought by Salvadoran tra US Pentagon trainers who were training death squads in El Salvador came after the 90s, after 92, came to LAPD and other police departments in the US to train the local police departments in counterinsurgency gang policing. So it's complex, this gang equation, it's, but it, it often excludes the police part of the equation and I put it back in. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a really important variable. And again, it's a very violent variable in this whole um, physical, enforcement of a whole legal paradigm a whole, and a whole national paradigm of who and what I would say the United States is. You know, when we first talked about uh, having this conversation, I had thrown out, I'd like to talk about how um, those of us in the, in the States are now seeing US foreign policy coming home and of influencing domestic policy. But I would now say, having read your book twice now, that it really is about U.S. domestic policy being exported. That violent um, expansion of the of the U.S. Uh, as you said earlier, the genocide of of a hot, an entire race of people is something that's that is part of U.S. history that is rarely talked about. It, it, certainly not to the extent of the, the, the violence and heinous act that it was. But that's used, you know, and then you go in to talk about this in 1930, 1932 El Salvador, but it had already happened here in the States. And so to me, it's almost like we're, we're seeing, I, I think I really had it backward when for myself, thinking about U.S. foreign policy coming home and talking to you and reading your book, it really is more of an exporting of U.S. violence, which you and the uh, later in your book, you know, say is necessary for all empires to to expand. And I, it really hit me very hard to frame it that way. And I believe it's more accurate. Yeah, it's a it's a complicated. Uh culture of violence that is part of the core functioning of states, right? One of the things that defines a state is the control of violence, right? Uh, according to political scientists and those that are into that. Uh, I think that, yeah, it, it is an exporting, but I prefer to talk about circuits. Because yeah. if you look at El Salvador, right, you have US trainers from the Pentagon going and training the Atlacot Battalion that wiped out a thousand people in 19, December 1981. Half of those people were children under 12. Half of those children under 12 were under six. I've seen the bones of those kids. I've spoken to people that have witnessed similar massacres. I was there when some of those massacres uh, were happening in the later part of the war. And so, you know, I, I come back from El Salvador to Los Angeles and I see the LAPD starting to get like, you remember Adam 12? I don't know if you're... Yes. You know, their uniforms <laughs> used to be really thin. Right. And, yeah. and, 
and and I, I start button noticing down shirts and <laughs> button down shirts really thin and suddenly mm -hmm. the police uniforms started getting puffier to the point of the robocop uniforms that we have now right pretty soon they're going to be so puffed up beyond robocop they're going to be like those inflated uh um those inflated, you know, in the Macy's parade, what do you call them? Oh, the, yes, the balloons. <laughs> yeah, the inflated giant balloons. <laughs> right. So militarized, because that's what they are. The inflation is a is a is a reflection of 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 militarism in of U.S. policing. And so, when those Pentagon trainers came from El Salvador from training the Atlacop Battalion and the death squads, they came to the United States to start training the police. And that's when you start seeing this counterinsurgency policing of what was known, for example, of the, as the crash anti-gang units. Right. And they targeted the gangs and they started making the gangs more violent by pitting them against each other, falsely arresting them, killing some, shooting them in the back, you know, doing all these things to divide, conquer, and kill the gangs so that they became more, more violent. Um, and, and my book is a, is a, is a personal telling of the wit of having witnessed all these different circuits. Because then, remember, those police in LAPD went to train El Salvador in some cases in the post-war era of the gangs in El Salvador. So you have the U.S. gang structures being born with the help of of, of William Barr, and then you have William Barr sending U.S.-style policing to to fight U.S.-style gangs, and then. You know, it's astonishing the way that these circuits work. It's the same. I mean, I think you, it, it's the same sort of circuit with, uh, with the arms trafficking from the U.S. into Mexico. Yeah. And, and then back and forth. Yeah. And it, it's very insidious. And the fascinating thing with the gangs in El Salvador is that they originated here, many of the members U.S. born, and, and then all deported to El Salvador. And so there's that exportation again, and then how it all, like you said, I think circuit is a, is a really brilliant um, description of it. You just mentioned, you know, in, in talking about all this violence that, that you've seen, you know, you've seen the bones of, of victims from 1932 to present day. And you also, uh, you've seen them in the burial sites, but you've also seen them, you know, in forensic labs. And one of the things you mention is in your book is how important these forensic anthropologists are. And as far as discovering the grave sites, as far as defining, you know, determining how people died, but also in that process, allowing families and friends to um, recognize the death of a family or friend and to start, or to, I guess I will say to stop forgetting, to start unforgetting, which allows for healing and moving forward. And Thank you for... No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you for, for bringing that up because uh, with all the violence of El Salvador's history, because it, it has been one of the most consistently violent places on earth since its founding in 1821. Um, with all the violence, what tends to get lost in, the, in it is, is the tenderness. Like, uh, like I like to say, the, my, my journey is one to, to excavate the ter tenderness that survives the terror. And there's a lot of beauty in my book. I, 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 try, I, I try to put a lot of beauty in my book. I did the best that I could to put the beautiful and the sublime that I've encountered because I already saw what was coming, like a lot of us in 2015, when I started the journey of this book and of writing it, that where the world was going, and I anticipated that we were going to have to, I was going, I, I wanted to contribute by bringing out whatever Jedi knowledge of uh, uh, transcendent knowledge I had about uh, sustainable struggle. Like I've been in it, for those that know me, since the 1980s early 90s up to the present, whether it was uh, joining the FMLN guerrillas, whether it was as a journalist, whether it was co-founding different organizations that have like presented.org uh, and that have done work of solidarity and, and others, there's always an undercurrent in my work of beauty and the sublime. There's a, I like to say the, there's a strategic value 
to the sublime and the beautiful right now that we need to understand. That's why in the content and in the form that I wrote, I try to make it as beautiful as possible. And the beauty is contained in two of the dominant metaphors. One of them is sewing. My grandmother was a seamstress and my grandmother would take disparate pieces of uh, cloth to create these beautiful dresses for the prostitutes of the shanty town that she lived in in San Salvador during a Great Depression that made Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath look like a wine festival. You know, and so my grandmother in her mathematical and creative beauty would just size up somebody literally and create a dress for them that gave them some of the dignity back after La Matanza, for example, had erased indigenous identity as a public thing. In the same way, and they, you know, my grandmother was giving that person a piece of the dream that they had in by the same token, right? The dream of having dignity, of being, of being an indigenous princess. In the case of one prostitute, my, my grandmother lived next door to. By the same token, the forensic specialists sew together the story, sew together the bones of a deceased, desaparecido person to tell the story of what actually happened. What were the final days of that person like? To then give to the family, as I, as I narrate, the story, the bones, and therefore the beginning of, of some closure and, and the beginning of some unforgetting that I think individuals and families and nations have to undertake right now if we're to fight uh, the, the enormous crises we face. We have to we have, to have a political vision that, that doesn't just look forward, but that also looks backward in a clear way. And that's, I think, what the foundation for solidarity and, and, and revolutionary politics of the future are. So I'm thinking about a number of things simultaneously now with this comment. I, you know, understanding the understanding the past and coming to terms with it is so important on on all levels moving forward. And yes, on a global scale, more important now than ever, um, particularly for young people. We older people really need to do the unforgetting to help them create a better planet for themselves. And I, and I. I see that in so much of your personal story with your father, because you as a young man really struggled without your, without your father or because of your father's forgetting, quote unquote, because of your father's forgetting, that did not allow you as a young man, his son, to really understand yourself, your family, your bicultural um, heritage. It was, it was it made for a very confusing, frustrating, and at one point violent um, youth. And, and I, I'd like you to talk about that because I think it's so important what you just said is for us as nations to come together and to unforget, understand where we came from in order to go forward as um, peoples and not just simply nation states. And I think that is, is the, the, the experience of your personal life is really analogous to that. Uh, that's kind of one of my points in my book is to show the connection between the personal and the political. They really always are connected. My first rage against authority was against my father. You know, and like psychologists like R.D. Lang, you know, from the 60s, who wrote a book called The Politics of the Family and the politic, another book called The Policy of the Experience, and, you know, tells us that the first entry point for the state in our lives are in fact our parents through their subconscious, the way that the state, propaganda, education, and other things insinuate themselves in the family, right? And our families unconsciously sometimes adopt beliefs and words and beliefs that are kind of messages from the state. You can see Donald Trump doing it, but you could also see Barack Obama doing it. They're just different forms of the same thing. And so I was aware of this and I wanted to kind of like show in my own example, the way that I was, I led this kind of crazy life and doing things that I didn't know why I did them. And whether it was becoming you know, a violent kid and you know, engaging in criminal activity or joining the FMLN. I didn't know why I did it. I just knew that I, I wanted to do that. 
And then I go and I discover a secret that I can't share with the, with the audience, Terry, because I'd be giving away the whole book and then right. people get, right. I already heard the story. So uh, there's a big atom bomb of a secret that my dad has that I discover. And that discovery of that secret, I, I hope and I try to show is the thing that connected my gut, literally my intestines, the tightness and trauma that I contain in my gut to, you know, it's umbilical connection to state violence, right? Yeah. That tightness in my gut was connected to the state violence of history that I didn't even know I was carrying. But then I find out, I did the excavation. So then that explained to me why I was such an angry kid, why I did crazy things. And it's been so liberating for me to write this book because I now have an arc explaining, you know, myself to myself, but also explaining my father. And it allows me to be more tender and loving towards my father, who I had a lot of anger towards, because I understand more deeply what it was to live in the Great Depression that made John Steinbeck's Great Depression look like a wine tasting, right? So, um, yeah, that's the, the, the healing is real in the writing. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating read, and it is, you know, it is a, a multi-level analogy and I, the thing that really came through for me, you mentioned that you were, you know, careful to be sure you talked about beauty. And I think in the unforgetting, we, we re um, encounter our humanity, that the forgetting is kind of push, you know, to, to heal emotional scars, physical scars, so that we can survive. And everybody has different levels of forgetting for very different reasons. And the whole nation state forgetting is, is causing, you know, so much of the violence today, as you mentioned earlier. But that aspect of humanity that you keep bringing back into the book, the women you talk to, who I think one young student in LA who talks to you about the, the garden she was sequestered in and climbing the trees and having this beautiful vision the vista of the countryside, the fruit she was able to eat, and you just, you know, those are very human um, sentiments and experiences among all the physical violence. Mm -hmm. And I think that with th those moments that you bring out are so important. And I, I love the sewing analogy, the, the creation out of, you know, pieces which is what so much of society is particularly i would argue for immigrants like your parents and my grandparents coming to this country these pieces that they bring with them and what do you do next you know and your grandmother made beauty made beautiful dresses out of remnants and i i, I just love that whole um, telling of her and her ability to create out of just remnants. And as you mentioned, there's the bones, the bones of these from these mass graves are remnants of physical remnants of human beings, but also remnants of people's lives, their greater lives, not their individual lives, but their families and society as well. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was trying to do. And I hope to elicit that in the reader. Uh, there's a third layer that's kind of unspoken. I, I kind of hint at it at the end. That's, the, that's what, so what a forensic scientist did do, or what my grandmother did in terms of piecing things together, I try to do with words. And you can see it at the end of the book where I'm at a table at La Boheme Coffee Shop here in San Francisco mm -hmm. in the Mission District. And the table is, a, is my favorite table when I go there. People that know me here in the city know I'm in that corner when, when we're not in COVID-19 working on my computer on top of a table that is a converted sewing machine that still has underneath the table it still has the gears and they and the and the and the treadle of the singer sewing machine the iron horse and so when i'm typing there i'm i'm almost revisiting my grandmother being on my grandmother's lap as she was kind of creating the conditions for our livelihood in san francisco uh, coming from the desperate and just devastating history of El Salvador coming here and sewing those 
those clothes together to make us sustainable. I'm trying to do the same thing with our words by taking the fragments of my life and the experiences I have, one of which, which I think is especially important to your audience, is the experience of solidarity, solidaridad. I was part of, you know, uh, the solidarity movement here in the United States. I was with Carecen, with the Comité de Refugiados, and I actually made a point to try to draw out the beauty of solidarity in it, because there is a beauty. And kind of connecting with something so far from us and yet doing and committing a piece of our lives, like with people like my old friend Don White of Committee in Solidarity to People of El Salvador. Like, like this man gave up a large piece of his life before he died to the people of El Salvador. And uh, I, I'll never forget him and others or people that I met in El Salvador who were, uh, you know, uh, guerrilleros and guerrilleras from Mexico, from Spain, from across the world. I mean, the way that, you know, the way that, the way that, say, Hemingway or Orwell see, saw uh, solidarity with, in, of the Lincoln Brigade in Spain, I saw the solidarity in El Salvador in the same way as, as, a, as a heroic act. And so I try to do at least a little bit of justice to that beauty, the beauty of that his, his heroic act of, of joining a people's struggle across borders, which I think is fundamental and seriously lacking right now here in the United States in our concepts of politics, even on the, even on the left. Yeah, especially on the left, I would argue yeah. we've lost, yeah. We've yeah, lost and, if, and, if, that. and, and if, it doesn't matter what race you are, whether you're white, black, Latinx, or whatever you call yourself, there's, a, there's many people whose concept of politics is limited to the borders of the United States. And that's already, that's already basically an embrace of empire at a certain level. When, um, you know, when, when you fail to see the global context that the United States is in and the connections, whether it's through immigrants, through trade, through militarism, through police models, if we fit, we're not gonna get anywhere being bordered off um, in a multicultural movement. I, I could care less that Beyonce is somebody's ally, quite frankly. Beyonce is class-wise a billionaire. I don't know any billionaires who are our, our class ally. Even if they, you know, even though she, she has these Black Panther things at the Super Bowl or, you know, I mean, she also has, you know, Thai sweatshop labor women sewing, speaking of sewing, an empowerment uh, outfits for, for sale in the US for big money. So anyway, I don't wanna get distracted by Beyonce and all that, but my point is the concepts of politics um, are, are, I think are dangerously bordered off. And I'm, I, I'm sharing the experience in my book of solidarity and of revolution in order for people to, as an act of political imagination, so that people kind of start thinking about politics in the way we did in America Latina. Well, I have to say, you mentioned solidarity and my activism interest in Latin America really began when I was in sixth grade. My sixth grade teacher introduced me to Mesoamerica and pre-Columbian cultures. And at that time I was growing up in, in um, the Catholic church under liberation theology, which you touch on in your book too, as well as evangelical um, religions. And all these years in and out of Latin America and some just touching on work and, in, and, and then at other points in my life, you know, it being 100% of my time and work as more now, I have to say, and I say this with great sincerity, of all the solidarity movements, groups of people, communities of people that have made the biggest impression on me are the Salvadorans, specifically those with a history in the FMLN, as far as understanding community and as far as understanding organizing and being able to come together and not be, I guess, petty about identity and things like that. There's the ability for Salvadorans to organize is impressive. It's rapid, it's solid, and people just come together and make things happen. And I have consistently seen that over the years. And you see it with other organizations as well and other groups of people, but with the Salvadoran community, it is consistent. 
and has been consistent for the last 30, 40 years. It's very impressive and it's really something admirable. Yeah, I tried to get at a little bit of that political culture that you and I both partook of. And I mean, I don't put it in the book, but I, I, my theory about Salvadorans and politics and why, for example, one of every three people had adopted organized politics at the height of the war. You can read Nakla and see an article in 1989 about how there was a poll that said one of every three people was organized against the Salvadoran state and had adopted radicalized politics. That has to do with some things like the density of El Salvador, very tightly, small population. You also have like La Matanza um, creating, sadly, a more homogenous culture so that you don't have the organizing issues that you have in a place like Guatemala, where you have to organize across different, uh, a, a broader expanse of geography and a broader expanse of languages, for example. Yeah. Right, you have all these different Maya Quiche, Maya Canjoval, mm -hmm. different identities. Thankfully, thank goodness, I wish El Salvador had more indigenous identity than it does, but it's been forced to go underground. And so for different reasons, yeah, that, I, I bring that into the book uh, to show the spirit of the, of the matter that made, made Salvadoran organizing one of the most thrilling experiences for many of us to the point where the CIA, for example, said that uh, Salvadoran opposition and people's movement was one of the most effective people's movement in the Americas in the 20th century. And, and so I try to, in between the lines, I'm doing my best to show whatever Jedi knowledge of revolutionary kind of organizing and spirit I could amass. But I do it through the telling the story of actual people who were revolutionaries and what they taught people like me. So I, I, I'm thinking about several things simultaneously. The, you mentioned um, you know, the Salvadoran culture being more homogenous since 1932 and that being part of the ability to um, organize, um, unlike uh, a lot of the cultural um, diversity in Guatemala. And when I was reading your book, you're, you know, you have so many synonyms you use for forgetting. And one of the things that was that I've heard over and over again in Guatemala, specifically since, um, you know, the Maya people were given um, genocide status by the UN, and how they were able to, after the attempt to completely exterminate them in the 80s, they talk about memory, which I think is you know their 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 historical memory and and not they had to get to a place as a people the maya people where they could start talking about what happened to them their women specifically get the men talking about what happened to the women in their in their culture before they had to do this memory before they could actually admit the genocide and then petition for that status from the un and i just think that's just one more heinous example of, of what people suffer. But what has to be done first, that unburying, that excavating, unburying, that unforgetting, that has to be done in order to heal and move forward, on, uh, you know. Absolutely, I wish, I wish I had the time to do another book on Guatemala. Uh, um, you know, I think I have well, we have writers like Hector Tobar and writers in Guatemala who are far better equipped than I am to tell that story as, as there are Salvadoreña and other writers. It's, actually, I wanna make that point too is that, I mean, mine is just one story. And one of my motives for writing this was to demonstrate in fact that Salvadorans and Central Americans in the United States have the ability to tell comp as compelling and powerful a Salvadoran and Central American story as non-Salvadoran and non Central American writers in the US have won prizes for. I'm not criticizing yeah. any of those writers, but the fact is uh, you can look in your bookshelf. You don't have any books about Central American nonfiction. This is the first nonfiction book by a US Central American about Central Americans published by a major big five publisher, HarperCollins. And so we've been here for, since the 19th century and in large numbers since you know, the 1950s. And so 
uh, there are reasons that we haven't been afforded the space to tell our own stories, including, for example, the fact that 1% of books in the United States are Latino, Latinx books by Latinx authors, 1%. Wow. So, and we're within the margins, because you've got to remember the big groups in the Latino, Latinx space are Mexican, Chicano, Puerto Rican, and uh, Dominican and Cuban, right? I mean, those are in the literary sense. Those are the ones that are recognized. And, and in the case of Mexicans, it's a colossal community that has no literary publication record in the US reflective of its numbers. And that's not the Mexican and Chicano's fault. That's the publishing industry fault because most Mexicans are on this side of the Appalachians rather than on the other side in New York. So. See, I think, you know, listening to you say this, I think that's all part of, you know, of the US nation state, quote unquote, forgetting. You know, the, a good part of the Western United States was part of Mexico and Spain at one point in time. And so, you, you know, and there's that whole violent history as to how those Texas in particular, how it, you know, became, you know, part of the United States. And you just, you, to not have more stories like yours or, or, or migrants who just who not even born here don't you know to hear those stories as to what the heritage is why people come I think it's intentional I have to say it's part of the it's part of the U.S. nation state forgetting so to speak I don't think you can erase a community of 60 million people in film in Sunday news shows in the political narrative of the United States and in literature and other cultural and media systems with such just totality without it being having a degree of intentionality. And I think it's, a, it's an intentionality of a country that doesn't feel it can move beyond a black white narrative of itself. Many scholars of race and identity in the United States, you know, look at what's known as the black white binary, the conception that the United States is primarily just black and white. And so, you know, you see this and, 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 and those of us of, who are neither black nor white, although Latino is black, right? Afro-Latinos mm -hmm. are a large population and they're not a part of the equation either. So, you know, those of us outside of that equation kind of see this conception that's very obsolete and actually dangerous when you look, for example, at the numbers of people identified under this category of Latino, whatever, getting COVID-19, uh, the, the children, among children, the largest group that's getting COVID-19 are, are Latino children. Uh, of, you know, uh, you know, deaths by police. We're not hearing about the killings of, of young men here in San Francisco, in Fresno, in LA, and out throughout the Southwest and on the East Coast who are Latinos. We're not hearing about that. It's incumbent upon Latinos to bring that up. And we are, but, we have to push even harder because the system doesn't seem to want to, seems to say there's already enough room and God bless the black community for, 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 for leading the way to abolishing police and, and, and bringing our awareness of the prison system and of what's happening to black bodies. Um, but, but, you know, we're, we're going to advocate for our own dead and our own youth too. Otherwise they're going to be continued slaughtering our youth with impunity and with invisibility and forgetting and forgetting yeah forgetting and then we just and then we have more young people suffering a, 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 you know a childhood as as you did with the lack of understanding with the lack of knowledge with the lack of connecting any sort of continuum about your your family your culture and yourself as an individual that's exciting to me right now because I'm already getting responses from people who, who like yourself have already read the book. I got these notes from these young Salvadorans and Central Americans and they're on fire for this because if only because they've never seen themselves in the, on the written page in the English language. To read about themselves, they have to go read stories like Roque Dalton, Claribel Alegria and Latin American writing, but they have no stories except in, in, in smaller presses and hard to get to spaces 
like a, an anthology that I, I I was a part of called The Wandering Song, which is great. But you 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 have it's out of print because it's sold out. It's, so there's not a lot about us. So when these kids are seeing a major publisher, with publishing a book that's about us, and and coming um, out of the United States, written by someone out of the, born here, about and, us here. Yes, it's it's yeah. a it's a it's a it's a seminal moment, and, and that's not even saying if the writing's any good. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'll, it I'll be, is. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let the critics be the judges. I'll let the reader. All I'll say is that I put el todo por el todo to make it as sublimely, sublime and beautiful as I could because I recognize, not just for those Salvadoran and Central American kids, but for those of us on the left, those of us in solidarity, I, I, I use my book as an example of what I call the strategic value of the sublime and the beautiful at a time of epic crisis right now. Like I said, we're not going to face what we're facing right now in the world, you know, whether it's Trump, economic decline, you know, of neoliberalism, the continuation of neoliberalism, the militarization of our inner cities, uh, COVID-19. And then if we, we deal with that, then we're going to have to go toe to toe with climate change. So we're not going to Democrat, liberal, or progressive our way out of this. We're going to have to develop something of another order. And I think that, that that other order has to include the spiritual power given to us by the sublime and the beautiful that makes for sustainability of struggle. It's a, fan, it's a fantastic story. And I really, um, I'm so... I, I'm so happy that you wrote this. And I think that the message for all of us is really that you share is really, really profound. I mean, that your story as the analogy for all of us to move forward is just, is so, uh, is so important and so profound. And I know Roberto, I promised you 20, 30 minutes today, and we've been talking for almost an hour and I'm so okay. thankful for that. Is there anything I want to show the audience your book again? Can you see? Yeah. And um, read it and buy it, read it and read it more than once and then share it. Is there anything that, um, that we should add to our conversation this morning before I let you go? Uh, you know, I, I, I would just add a, a big thank you to you and Code Pink, Terry, for your work. I've known you all for many years and you've been with it and, you know, you, 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 the way you erase the, the border between femininity, feminism, and politics, and, and, and global politics at that has been a, a gift to us all. I, I, I want to commend you for that and thank you, and especially with the work with America Latina that Medea and others have held. I also want to say that uh, I just hope people understand my book is, is at its core a very hopeful book. It just takes a very underworld, stark, dark journey that I took so that you didn't have to, to tell this story. But I do it with the intent to bring out the tenderness that survives the terror, the stuff that we're going to need for sustainable struggle. And I, I guess a lot of folks are struggling right now to, to, to find their way in, in, in struggle and in just living. And I, I would ask people to read my book as a, as it's my blueprint for how to survive an apocalyptic age. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's goodness and there's beauty and there's, there's, there's success to be had despite it all. And I just encourage people to keep their heads up as we face whatever challenges are before us. Thank you so much. I'm so My thankful pleasure. for your time. I'm thankful for your work and for your friendship. And, um, and thank you for this lengthy conversation. I know you gave me so much more time than, uh, than we had initially talked about. So I want to tell our audience that uh, Roberto's uh, conversation can also be heard Thursday on Code Pink Radio, broadcasting on WPFW, DC, WBAI, New York City, simulcasting on both stations. 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Um, Eastern, and then rebroadcasting again, 7.30 p.m. 
um, Eastern. So thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. I'm going to reread your book now with yet more insight. And I'm so thankful for the, the, the political analogy that it offers. And it's so hopeful um, for young people and it's marching orders for us older people. And I think that, you know, one of the things I'll just say real in closing, because you mentioned the under, underworld and, and it makes me think of the responsibility of us older people, which, which indigenous cultures so understand that older people are to leave the world better for the upcoming generations. And you talked about going under, into the underworld, into the dark space, but also you tell um, an indigenous story about that and how the the bones of the people in the soil are the fertilizer for the life above mm -hmm. so to speak yeah and i think that's um that's a wonderful story and i think that's what we all need to be now the fertilizer for the future so thank you thank you so much roberto always wonderful to see you and speak with you my pleasure terry thank you thank you bye-bye bye-bye